Hi, I'm Matthias Krings at Catanion. Let's talk about late-stage R&D project assessment. Late-stage assets, post proof of concept that is, have less scientific and technical uncertainty than pre-proof of concept projects. Ideally, a proof of concept has been demonstrated in an indication that is clinically and commercially relevant. The better the fit of clinical endpoints, doses and patient populations in POC trials for use in pivotal and confirmatory trials, the more robust the proof of concept result is. Given the greater investment of money, time and resources in the full development of POC assets, proof of concept that is, greater emphasis is laid on quantitative assessment. As such, the late stage assessment aims to quantify the opportunities and risks of the project. We cover this in the following way. Which indications have been selected and what is the priority sequence for development and launch? The size of the commercial opportunity. We do this with target product profiles or TPPs in short and market environments. And we do sales forecasts. Then we assess risks of various types. R&D risks, technical, scientific, clinical, regulatory. And of course, financial risks, costs will be huge, potentially. Financial valuation, we do expected net present value analysis and step up expected net present value analyses. And of course, consolidation, development and launch strategy must not be forgotten. Development and launch priorities and sequence, decision tree, summarizing possible events, scenarios, probabilities of success, development strategy, summarizing trial arms, patient population, patient numbers, duration, costs. These analytical steps build on elements already assessed for pre-proof of concept projects, but here they go deeper and they are more quantitative. All of these concepts will be explained in more detail. Now, let's start with indications selected and priorities for development and for launch. Depending on the breadth of the exploratory trials and the number of indications covered there, project teams can find themselves in a spectrum of situations. Ideally, proof of concept was demonstrated in an indication of clinical relevance and commercial priority and clinical data support one to two additional indications to be pursued in later trials. In this case, development and launch sequence of earlier pre-proof of concept considerations are confirmed and guide further um, in-depth analyses. However, often phase two data do not support the plan originally made. Some indications are dropped for lack of support in the data and other indications gain relevance. In that case, teams may find themselves back at the drawing board for parts of the path forward. Indications supported by data may advance and build on prior analysis and other indications newly appearing uh, on the project scene may require an analysis much like the Catanian early stage assessment. In any case, project teams and portfolio managers working with them will have to identify the lead and follow-on indications for full development, which should be assessed as we will explain going forward. Let's now talk about the commercial opportunity. It's built on target product profiles or TPPs in short and market environments. TPPs should compare the asset in question to current and future standards of care. Two to three outcomes, minimum, base and upside TPP should quantitatively cover the key clinical endpoints and relevant parameters in efficacy, safety, convenience, etc. vis-a-vis the standard of care and result in clear scores which can be inferior, par or superior, and sometimes non-inferiorities uh, of importance. The parameters listed are typically very specific to the treatment algorithms established and the profiles of the drugs already in use. After all, prescribers will compare the very parameters of established drugs versus any new entrants. TPP outcomes should be realistic and avoid extremes, so no worst or best cases. Of course, the targets um, for parameters in the TPP, some based on actual data generated, some aspirational for the confirmatory studies, must be aligned with actual clinical development plans and strategies. 
needless to say, perhaps the trial described in the development plan must be able to deliver the data that determine the TPP. Oftentimes, this is ensured in an iterative process. Market environment scenarios, typically a positive and a negative one, cover market conditions the asset will encounter upon launch in terms of number, class and relevance of competitors, in terms of price levels and oftentimes indication-specific factors such as disease awareness, diagnosis and treatment rates, etc. Just as in the TPP outcomes, market environment scenarios should be realistic and avoid extremes. Again, no worst or best cases. Now, sales forecasts. Ultimately, they're the simple product of average price per patient per year times the number of patients treated. The factors contributing to price and patient number can be broken down into several parameters which come with different degrees of uncertainty. Scenario analysis can help in several ways when dealing with uncertainty. Embrace realistic ranges of key parameters, identify most relevant parameters, determine where market research is most useful to reduce the uncertainty, and provide transparency of assumptions and thus build trust in quality of the analysis and the research it is based on. Four to six market scenarios are then generated by a combination of two to three TPP outcomes with two market environment scenarios. This provides a realistic range of exemplary situations the asset could arrive in after launch. It avoids extremes and it avoids combinatorial explosion of factors and thus avoids paralysis by analysis. For each project scenario, um, peak sales are assessed first and then a life cycle curve is applied. Let's look at patient numbers. Peak sales per drug are a share of sales in the entire indication. Epidemiology numbers establish the basis and annual patient prevalence or incidence are reduced by factors such as diagnosis rate, treatment rate and of course compliance. The, uh, the specific drug's patient share depends on its competitiveness which is best assessed by gauging the share of the drug class in question, by market entry, by share of voice and by marketing strength of the selling party and importantly by the relative competitiveness of the drug's profile vis-a-vis -vis competitor. Most importantly of course the standard of care. Patient numbers thus established in market scenarios will vary depending on the differences in parameters in the TPP outcomes and the market environments um, combined in each market scenario. Price levels and competitiveness of drug profile are next. Established price levels at present are the basis for gauging future prices. Prices actually assumed will depend on the price levels of competitors in the indication as a whole, but more specifically by price levels in the drug class in question. If there are generics in the market, especially if a standard of care has become generic, price levels of all drugs, especially new entrants, will be affected. Against the backdrop of established price levels, the specific drug's price level will depend on the competitiveness of its profile. Again, comparing efficacy, safety, convenience, vis-a-vis um, -vis all the alternative treatments. Now, note that the commercial forecasts prepared for the purpose of project strategy, project assessment, and valuation are strategic in nature. As such, while depth and accuracy are important, they must not be confused with operational country-specific forecasts typically used for launch preparation and beyond. For the purpose of project and portfolio management, comparability of assumptions and their range trumps total depth. Next, we will talk about risks. R&D risks for starters, technical, scientific, clinical, regulatory, our R&D risk assessment and mitigation planning. It is an unpleasant truth that most projects in biopharma R&D fail, as the industry's low transition rates from face to face tell us. All teams and companies are trying to beat the odds and we have developed over the past 20 plus years, together with hundreds of expert clients, 
a systematic approach to identifying, assessing and quantifying technical, scientific, clinical and regulatory risks with the intention to address and mitigate these risks where possible and to make risks of different projects comparable. Catanian's R&D risk assessment brings a lot of value to project teams, functions and decision makers in the following ways. Teams are supported by a systematic structure to ensure no stone is left unturned. Having identified risks is a first step to planning risk elimination by setting up the appropriate analyses, experiments and trial designs together with the team's functional experts and their functions peers. Talking of which, functional leaders benefit from a systematic overview of risks across projects enabling comparison of risk levels and drawing on mitigation strategies that have proven useful in related cases. And finally, decision makers can rely on the best effort for complete coverage of risks across projects. Catanian's R&D risk assessment is a proven industry blueprint. It enables a portfolio analyst to assess risks together with each project team in the portfolio thus ensuring the same yardstick is used and fairness is applied to all project teams and their projects. What's more, the R&D risk assessment allows portfolio managers to gauge project-specific probabilities of success for projects to transition into the next phase of R&D. The R&D risk assessment is established as a user-friendly software and easy to grasp Structure helps establish common terminology for handling risks um, and here are the classes. Conceptual risk, infrastructure risk, non-clinical risks, clinical risk, CMC risk and of course regulatory risk. Catanian R&D risk assessment comes in phase specific versions from target identification to phase 3. It's available in versions tailored to small molecules, to biologics, to vaccines and to CAR T cell therapies. Financial risks are next. Investment into full development of an asset in one or more indications can bear significant financial risks. Cost planning must reflect the clinical development plan and beyond, including filing, launch, marketing and various other future cost items. As with commercial forecasts, cost planning for the purpose of project strategy, project assessment and valuation is strategic in nature. Depth and accuracy are important, but need not be as detailed as operational country-specific plans typically used for launch preparation and beyond. For the purpose of project and portfolio management, comparability of assumptions and their range trumps total depth. Project costs to be considered for a project must be allocated to the year they are incurred for later use in financial valuation, and they typically include the following. Deal costs, if there is a deal, upfront, milestone, royalty payments. Of course, development costs, clinical, non-clinical, CMC. Filing costs for FDA, EMA or other regional um, agencies. Costs of goods sold, COGS in short. Selling costs like launch and marketing costs, legal costs for patents, etc. Capital expenditure. Financial valuation is next. ENPVs and step-up ENPVs. That stands for expected net present value ENPV and it is in essence the sum of all discounted cash flows of the life cycle of a project from the perspective of the day of the analysis. ENPV analysis serves the purpose of assessing the financial value of a project and of making projects comparable. Consistency of central parameters is key such as the discount rate, global tax rate, time of explicit forecast period and the perpetuity growth rate thereafter. This determines the terminal value and other parameters like this. Step-up ENPVs provide the project value at future points in time, for example after inflection points such as successful completion of clinical phases. These values are generated by assuming completion of a certain phase rendering the probability 100% and considering all cash flows up to that point sunk cost. Step-up ENPVs in this way inform portfolio managers about the potential multiple of the investment into the clinical program and can provide important guidance for timing of partnering a project. 
ENPV and step-up ENPV analysis require sophisticated modeling. Various softwares exist. Validated Excel models provide great flexibility as all projects differ in specific ways. Catanion has developed an adaptable suite of Excel workbooks that have mastered every challenge so far. So with all this in place, we can discuss consolidation, development and launch strategy next. All the analyses serve several purposes, one of which is to inform decision makers about the risk, return and strategic fit of a project in a format that makes it easy to understand and easy to compare with other assets in the portfolio. To this end, a standardized summary and a limited set of visuals are often all that is required. In fact, oftentimes less is more, um, and that is the virtue here. While every company and team of decision makers have their own preferences, there are a few elements that have emerged as must-haves over the past 20 plus years of our work with biopharma clients. And here they are. Development and launch priorities and sequence. Typically, a simple gun chart overview of addressable indications and their intended development sequence is a start. The planned development phases, transition points, filing and launch dates are next. Brief additions of trial type, trial size, trial population, patient numbers um, is all it takes to complete the initial overview. Next is a decision tree summarizing possible events, scenarios and probabilities of success. Underlying the above development plan we discussed is a decision tree which captures all development and launch scenarios and the market scenarios, each with the probability of success of progression to the next phase and the probabilities of each market scenario coming to pass. Then a summary on financial and commercial assessment. In the same scenario structure as the decision tree, cost, sales, value of scenario can be summarized in a single chart. And of course, an overall summary of the project assessment can be useful, especially when dealing with numerous assets in a portfolio, which bears a need to be able to quickly recapture facts of a project. It goes without saying that there is a difference between a high-level executive summary and a detail-rich cheat sheet type summary, which is also useful. Interested? Then connect with Catanian today to learn more.